But I want to I want to show you a video. It, it's, I think it's uh, the guy's Tim Barnett. He's with uh, Stand to Reason, which is Kokel's group, and you, you'll like this video. This is what que the power of questions. Oh, hi there. So there's a video of Canadian Conservative Party leader that's gone viral because it's, well, awesome. It features Pierre Polyev eating an apple while being interviewed by a local journalist. The end result is a masterclass in how to respond when you're in conversation with someone who disagrees with you. Take a look. Um, on, the, on the topic, I mean, in terms of your sort of strategy currently, you're obviously taking the populist uh, pathway. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> well, ap appealing, appealing to people's uh, more emotional levels, I would guess. Um, I mean, what certainly, you mean certainly, you, certainly, you tap, certainly you tap uh, very strong ideological language quite frequently. Like what? Uh, left wing, you know, this and that, right wing, they, you know, I mean, it's that, that type I of ideological thing. I never really talk about left but or right. Anyways, a lot I of people. I don't really believe in that. Okay. A lot of people would, would say that you're simply taking a page out of the Donald Trump uh, well, book. Probably like which people would say that? Well, I'm sure a great many Canadians, but. Like who? <laughs> I don't know who, but. Well, you're um, the one who asked the question, so yeah. how, you must know somebody. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sure there's some out there, but anyways, the, the point of this the point of this question is, I mean, why should why should Canadians trust you with their vote, given, you know, not not just the sort of ideological inclination in terms of taking the page of Donald Trump's book, but what are you also, talking about? What page? What page? Can you give okay. me a page? Give me the page. You keep <laughs> in, saying in terms that. in terms of tur turning things quite dramatically in terms of of Trudeau and and the left wing and all of this. I mean, you 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 make quite a you know it's it's quite a play that you make on it. So I'm I'm not just sure. I don't under, I don't know what your question okay. is. Okay, then forget that. Why should Canadians trust you with their vote? Common sense. All right, let's cut it off there. I want you to notice two things about this interaction. First, Pierre Polyev uses no less than seven simple questions to disarm this journalist. Notice how the reporter accuses Polyev of taking the populist pathway and using a page out of Trump's playbook. In response, he neutralizes these accusations by two simple questions, or at least two kinds of questions. The first is, what do you mean by that? It's the clarification question. When someone says something and you're not sure what they mean, or someone calls you a name, or someone makes an accusation against you, it's important to clarify what they mean. In this interview, Polyev is accused of obviously taking the populist pathway. In response, he asks, what do you mean by that? This is a brilliant question. Before he can respond to the claim, he needs to get clarification on the claim. So he asks, what do you mean by that? The second question in Polyev's arsenal is how do you come to that conclusion or some variation of it? This is a demand for evidence. When the journalist accuses Polyev of using very strong ideological language, he asks, like what? Rather than get defensive or lose his cool, Polyev simply asks for some evidence for the claim. When he's accused of taking a page out of Donald Trump's book, he asks, what page? Give me the page. Unfortunately, this reporter thought he could get away with slogans rather than substance, and these questions put that on full display. So the first thing I want you to notice is Polyev's masterful use of questions. Second, I want you to notice how comfortable Polyev looks during this entire exchange. Doesn't he look totally relaxed just enjoying his apple? This isn't a coincidence. By skillfully using questions, he's able to stay out of the hot seat and in the driver's seat in this conversation. Questions keep you safe even when you're being questioned by a journalist. So whatever your political leanings, I think we can all appreciate this masterclass in using good questions in tough conversations. So that's a taste of the application side of things. And, but you have to have a pretty good firm understanding of your background if you're going to ask those questions, because he's gonna respond back and you may not have someone that has no idea on how to deal with you at the other end. Obviously, the reporter kind of fell apart, but um, but I think you can you can see that questions are really disarming, uh, and and the people that are challenging us or calling us names or whatever may not understand why they're doing it, and to ask them just for clarification can actually disarm a lot of situations, and some sometimes it makes it 
fall away. And, and that is a, a skill that I think we, we all, I, I need to learn. That would be the next step. Where I, this is just as a bit of a taste of what you can do with, with knowledge base. But yeah, I, I love this video because it, it, it really does demonstrate where they're just talking points. There's no backing. There's no, nothing underneath it other than a, it's a name calling game. But instead of falling and trying to call names back, if you just engage them in a clarification exercise, what do you mean by that? Well, they don't have any idea what they mean by it. <laughs> they have no idea. They're waiting for your emotional response. So when you don't take the, the bait, now you can get the position where he got at the end where, okay, now he's ready to actually hear the answer. It wouldn't matter what Polly F. would have said before that got to the end. He would have got countered with the talking points. But once you peel off all the talking points, now it's just, what's the question? This is the answer. Okay, we're done. And it, it, it's it's... It's beautiful if we can just learn to do it. <laughs> well, for example, when my son calls me a Bible thumper, I guess next time I'll say, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 You know, and yeah. okay. well, how do you know this? Yeah. Yes, sir. When, if we go on and, and spend more time on the tactics, that's actually the next step, right? First, you get clarification so you know what you're talking about. Because one of the things that, if you listen to any of these guys that I, I was I was suggesting to you, one of the things they say is never try to disprove something the other person doesn't believe. So, it, like say a Jehovah Witness comes to you and starts talking to you, and you want to prove that Jesus is is true, you might be telling them things they don't even believe, they don't even know. Instead, listen to where they're coming from, what their exact position is before you try to counter it. And we we're really eager as Christians to prove we're right, because we are right. But sometimes you can use these kind of techniques to have them kind of unravel their own situation until you get down to the one stumbling block they have, and then just address that. And I think that is, that's the magic of what we call apologetics, is, is kind of learning that the way you're supposed to defend and have a reasoned argument or discussion. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's about what we have to do to address the questions that people are having and not allowing the moment when we're challenged to overwhelm us. It's the power of a question. I, 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 I shouldn't even say this since this is being recorded, but I, I use this professionally a lot. When I'm in a situation where I either don't have time to do something or I'm, I'm a little unsure, I just ask a question and put back on somebody else's head to, to do the next la layer. When you ask a question, it's now the burden of, of proof or delivery is on the other person. Uh, so when you're in a situation you feel like you're a little out of control, asking a question of the other person, it, it levels the playing field. You know, so all of a sudden now they have to answer a question before you answer a question. And, and if you keep that playing field level, emotionally you're in a better position to address whatever's going on. And two, they're not in that where they are being belittling to you because they, you know, they'll think they have the high ground. Well, level that ground with a question and it, it, it can change the dynamics of a conversation. And the scope of what we have to talk about isn't everything. We don't have to defend everything. I think that's we're often, we think we have to defend everything that people say against Christianity, and, and that is not true. And I want to, uh, let me introduce you to uh, Vody Bauckham. Does anybody know Vody Bauckham? I know my family does. He grew up here right in Houston. He's a oh, L.A. L.A. I guess he, he, was a, he, was a, he was a pastor here in Houston. Um, in Humble. Yeah, I, I know some people that know him. He now lives in Africa, but he gave a, a quick talk at Dallas Theological Seminary, and this is just a quibit from it, but listen how he shrinks 
the the scope of what we have to be prepared to defend? A couple of assumptions, and this is what really helped me. This just it it just blessed me. When you understand apologetics by the definition that I give that I've given you, know what you believe, why you believe it, and be able to communicate that in a winsome and effective manner to others. When you understand that, what it does is it really narrows the field. Because if my responsibility is really just to give an answer for the hope that is in me, then, then I don't have to know all the world religions. I just got to know the hope that is in me. Amen. Amen. I don't have to. There's a lot of stuff. So now th there's limitations on what you can even ask me. I'm not responsible, for example, for defending heresies because I don't believe them. I think that's a really important po point. It's, it's an hour-long talk, and it's, it's really nice. But it's, the idea is there are going to be people that are going to try to challenge Christianity with things you don't agree with. So don't defend it. I mean, we don't have to. And the, I like the way you know, Bodhi kind of puts it. It's like you don't have to defend things you don't believe. There's only two facts that you really have to be prepared to defend, and that's the hope that's in you, your, your, your walk with Jesus, and the contents of the Bible. That's really it. And you know, that makes the, the scope just shrinks. Our burden of proof is not everything. Our burden of truth is what we know and the basis for what we know. The key is learning so you can address the questions, and then when you're in a situation where you're going to be addressing somebody, the first step is to listen, not to talk. The second step is to listen, not to talk. You get the point? It, listening has to be the first step in defending our faith, because if we don't understand what it is the person has a problem with, then we're not really prepared to, to defend our faith, which is the reason the questions are so important. You have to ask them enough questions to clarify what it is their problem really is before you start defending something. Or you could be defending something that they don't, they don't have any issues with. So it's important to do that, and, and that reduces you know, the scope of the questions that we have to defend against. So when you're in that circumstance, I mean, obviously getting the knowledge that we're going to talk about is, is important, but recognizing that you don't have to defend against everything. You, you can shrink that scope to something that you can handle, and there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. Because I know I don't know a lot of things. I got two doctor degrees, and I still know nothing, right? I know less than most of you sitting in the room. It, it, it's, it's okay to say you don't know, okay? Because it, it, it's true. You don't know. Um, I want to give a couple more examples, and I think you'll guys really like. This is William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland. Uh, the, the video's bad. It's from 1998, so I apologize, uh, but well, let's just play it and then we can talk about it. You'll understand why I'm smiling. Consider the statement, quote, we should only believe what can be scientifically proven, end quote. Can that statement be scientifically proven? Well, obviously not. And thus the scientific naturalist's position refutes itself, and so it cannot be true. But um, do you deny that science cannot account for everything? Yes, I do deny that science So what can't it account for? Well, I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think there are a good number of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that we're all rational to accept. Let, so, me, list, let me list five. Logical and mathematical truths cannot be proven by science. Science presupposes logic and math, so that to try to prove them by science would be arguing in a circle. Uh, metaphysical truths, like there are other minds other than my own, or that the external world is real, or that the past was not created five minutes ago with an appearance of age, are rational beliefs that cannot be scientifically proven. Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful, like the good, cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with um, 
unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. But you're missing the so whole... So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So okay. we are... None of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us, and we're rational in doing so. Years ago, I was speaking at an evangelistic event in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was told that there was a very vicious atheist uh, who was a, had his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and been an engineer for 30 years, really hated Christianity, and a person was going to bring his boss uh, to this little evangelistic gathering where I was going to be sharing my faith. Well, I was at the hors d'oeuvre table before the event got going, and I saw this gentleman walk in the door with his boss. And sure enough, they made a beeline to the hors d'oeuvre table, and uh, this, this uh, friend of mine introduced me to this gentleman. And no sooner did we exchange pleasantries when he said, well, I understand that you're a philosopher and a theologian. And I said, well, I give it my best shot. <laughs> and he said, yeah, he said, I used to be interested in that myself when I was a teenager. But I've outgrown it now because I realize now that if you can't test it and quantify your data and measure it in the laboratory, it's nothing but a bunch of idle speculation and hot air. You ever heard anybody express that attitude? A lot of people have that attitude. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I let him go for about another two minutes. And then I interrupted him and said, excuse me, but uh, I have a question. I'm a little bit puzzled. If I understand you correctly, if you can't quantify something in the lab and test it scientifically, then the assertion is nothing but idle speculation of a bunch of hot air. And he said, that's absolutely right. He said, I've believed this for a long time. And I said, well, you've said 30 or 40 sentences uh, that have come out of your mouth in the last two minutes. And of the 30 or 40 things you've said, I can't think of a single thing that can be tested scientifically. <laughs> I said, if I'm wrong, would you show me which statement you've made that is scientifically testable? But if I'm right, do you see my dilemma? What you've been saying for the last two minutes is nothing but a bunch of... <laughs> Well, he changed the subject very quickly. But, but the point is that when people tell you that science is the only way we can know things or it's the only thing that's true, uh, that statement can't be true and it can't be known to be true. And so statements like this are false. Science, ladies and gentlemen, is a wonderful gift from God. And I'll say that before I close again. But it is only one way of knowing reality. It's important, but there are many ways to know reality outside of science. And the statement that science is the only way we can know reality is not itself something that can be known by science. And it is a self-refuting claim. So. Well, that's the, the preparation part, right? I mean, you have to be ready to, to deal with these type of guys. Uh, J.P. Moreland is also part of the Discovery Institute with Stephen Meyer, one of the guys that I, I mentioned earlier. But what a great rebuttal, non-aggressive, and totally under cut the argument because his argument was false and and so that is you know that that's that's what we're talking about is is building enough background so that we can defend our our faith non-aggressively purely truthfully and let them unravel their own arguments but you got to understand their arguments before you can do that if you don't understand their arguments you're not prepared to do what what these two guys were doing but you know i I really liked what uh, William Lane Craig said about science, and I think this is the one we I face a lot, obviously, with evolution and naturalism. And, and if you think about it, science has no opinions. Only scientists do. Actually, I, I think this is a, a Frank Turek says this a lot in his talks. The idea is science is just data, and, and, and you're looking for the effect or the cause of the, that data. Scientists make the opinions. It doesn't make it right just because a scientist says it. It doesn't matter how many PhDs they have, they're no smarter than you or I. So it, listening to the science is not listening to the scientist. Listening to the scientist is looking at what the data actually says. And I can tell you that 
there's no evolutionary data that supports evolution. They can have the opinion that it does, uh, but there, there, there are problems. We'll get to that another time. But science can't explain things like logic and math, because if there wasn't logic and math, there couldn't be science. You know, it, you, it can't explain anything metaphysical. Metaphysical is like our mind, our awareness. I mean, the fact that we can have a concept of time. These are all metaphysical concepts. They're not things that can be measured. We have to take it into account and take it for granted to do science. And so when people say there's nothing but the physical, the very fact they said that already took into account a metaphysical perspective. They have to have an awareness that there's nothing other than the physical. And we'll kind of talk about some of those conversations, uh, a lot of this uh, circular logic. And when you see them, you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's so easy. Now it's in your head. So when someone says it, you're, you're ready. Um, aesthetics, this is one thing we don't, we don't talk about. We'll talk about when we do the truth episode that beauty is, yeah, it's subjective from our opinion, but there's absolute beauty. I mean, God made things beautiful and everybody recognizes that they have aesthetics. It's something that's built into us as humans. It's not, it's not scientific. You can't explain why everybody's drawn to a certain thing, but people are. And that's, that's outside of, of uh, things science can do. And then obviously ethics and morals. There's no basis in science. There's no basis for ethic and morals without God. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about the evidences for God. And then obviously science can't explain science because that would be what well, that would mean science is beyond itself, right? You can never explain something if you're the something. So that's kind of the introduction to how to, how to defend your, your faith. And, and next week we will be talking about worldview and you and worldview. It, I, I never understood this. I didn't even know the concept, I'll be honest, until I went back to school. But this idea of being able to understand how people view and process things in the world actually explains a lot about where their, where their, their gap is in their understanding. And the reason they can't get over that hump to understand Christianity is the one livable thing. And the value of learning a worldview of somebody is you can see when they start stealing from your worldview. Because people say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. But then if someone steals their wallet, they think it's bad. And there's no basis for bad in the atheist worldview. There isn't. They have to have a standard. Without a standard, they're, so they steal from God. That's the purpose of the Stealing from God book where he identifies all these things that these different worldviews have to take away from the, the Christian God, or there's no basis for their argument at all. And when you, when you learn that worldview, now you're kind of prepared. So when you're talking to somebody, you kind of understand where the hole is. And when they say it, then you can say, well, but your worldview doesn't agree with that. So that, that's not from your perspective. And, and being able to ask the question so you can kind of you know, put that stone in their shoe idea where they're, they're living a, a half and half. They're taking advantage of the Christian worldview while saying they live this. And when you start pointing out the different points of their perspective that aren't based on what they say it is, it opens up the door that, so you might be able to have that conversation. Any questions, comments? Nothing? I'm either really, really boring, or I'm really, really boring. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, end with another song. And, and the atheist in that video is a guy by the name of Dr. Peter Atkin, or, yeah, Atkins. And he's debated William Lane Craig three other times after this. Can you imagine he came back for it? And he got embarrassed just as badly every time. Um, because there's no, there's no answer. You can see on his face. There's just no, there's no answer. Yeah, yeah. The, if you watch the, any debates, like uh, there's one with John Lennox and Richard Dawkins, and John, I can't remember exactly what the question is, but Richard Dawkins just looks off into space, like, no, like I got nothing. <laughs> I mean, he has, he just got nothing because it's, <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> and, and, Oh, one creature. You can see the evolutionary process. And, 
<laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it, and each of these guys have something that's kind of their special. But when you ask the right pointed question, they're just like you can just see on their face. It's like everything. It's just I, I refer to it as getting unzipped. They're getting exposed for what they are because there's just there's just nothing there. And so, okay, so. Um, well, if I guess you don't have any questions, we'll play my last song. Uh, this song you might not have heard. Do you know Danny Gokey? Uh, and there's, there's a story about... Yes, he finished second. Um, did you know that he, he lost his it was some cancer? Yes. So this, this song is kind of... That, that's the background of this song. Let's, it, it, the lyrics are up if you want to sing. It's a good singing song. Yeah, I, I love this song, but it kind of keeps, it brings everything in per, perspective a little bit. I mean, you know, I, we all have loved ones that we want to try to reach for Christ, and we have to kind of have peace with that. Yeah. So it's, uh, I hope that was was good for, for you guys. And let me go ahead and close with a prayer, and then we can chit-chat a little bit. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you. Thank you so much for providing so much evidence for you. Um, you, you didn't have to do that. We're, we're never worthy enough. But you, you love us so much. You give us everything we need so that we can see you. Help us to, to have peace you know, with whatever our loved one's decisions are and help us to choose the words and 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 provide reasonable discussions to try to reach our loved ones and the people you put in our life. Uh, I, I love you, Lord. I, I trust you with, with everything. And I'm so thankful for each and every one of these, these people, my friends, that came out to talk today because it was growing together is what you have asked us to do. That's what church is. That's what community is. And we all sitting here, know what you've asked us to do, and that's go, make, and teach. And that's the reason we're here. And thank you, Lord, for blessing this time. And I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.